Well, good morning. Uh, welcome to Cross Community Church. My name is Jason Waymeyer. I'm the lead pastor here and excited to be gathered with you. Uh, we're continuing our series called The Cradle That Robbed the Grave, where we're looking at the coming of Jesus Christ, the reason that we celebrate Christmas and how God, in giving us His Son, Jesus, uh, changed our lives and changed our eternity and gave hope to the entire world that all of us, because of our sin, were destined for death and eternity in hell. And because of the baby born in the manger, the cradle, uh, we no longer have to face the fear and the prospect of death. And so there's joy. Now, throughout this series, I've been giving you the big story of the Bible. It's the meta narrative, the overall story of the Bible, which begins with creation, that God created a perfect world in every way, that uh, Adam and Eve, created by God, enjoyed a perfect relationship with God and with one another and with all of his creation. So step one, creation, but step two of the story is the fall, when sin entered in and broke and marred the beautiful, perfect creation that God had created. Everything that was once um, in perfect order and harmony now found itself in disunity and enmity. And there was brokenness and there was suffering and there was pain. But it didn't stop there. The third step of the story of the Bible is redemption. That before the foundations of the earth, before anything had happened, God already knew that Adam and Eve were going to sin. The fall didn't catch him off guard. He wasn't like, what do I do now? But rather, God already had a plan in place to send his one and only son, Jesus Christ, to, to come to earth, to take on flesh, to live a perfect sinless life, and to go to the, to the cross for the sins of everyone who would come to faith in him, that he would be raised on the third day and that he would ascend into heaven where he would rule and reign fully and finally. Um, now, if that's all that God had done for us, giving us his, his one and only son, that we might be forgiven our sins, we would say, oh, what an extraordinary story, and it's far more than we deserve. But that's not the end of the story. There was the, the creation and the fall, and there's redemption. And today, we are going to look forward to the restoration of all things. You see, as we look at the first coming of Jesus Christ, we anticipate Christmas, and we see all that God has already done. We're reminded that He hasn't quite finished His work, that Jesus Christ is coming back again uh, to restore, to judge the world, and to restore all things that one day we might again enjoy a perfect relationship with God and with each other and with all of God's creation. In the restoration, Jesus is going to turn back the effects of sin. He's going to make all things new, that no longer will we have to live these lives that we experience in difficulty, in pain, in toil, in brokenness, no more suffering, no more sickness, um, but rather we'll live with God, reign with Him, a new heaven and a new earth for eternity. Now, if you have your Bibles, I'm going to ask you to turn with me to Revelation chapter 19. Now, if you're like me and you grew up in church, uh, I'm about 40 years old now. Uh, when they mentioned Revelation, I got a little bit nervous. Uh, anybody else have this experience? Uh, I think it was, I'm not exactly sure what year it came out, but there was a book written by a man who was a, a, an engineer with NASA and also a Bible student. And he wrote a book in the late 80s that stirred some things up for all of us. It was uh, 88 Reasons Why the Rapture Will Happen in 1988. Anybody remember? Anybody still have a copy of the book, right? Well, it was a big stir if you were a church person, right? Uh, I remember adults talking about this. And of course, as I began to hear about the rapture and what it is, I was like, oh my goodness, I was a kid at the time. And uh, by the way, if you're unfamiliar with the rapture, basically, as we read through Revelation, we see that there is a coming tribulation where things are going to get extraordinarily difficult in our world. And so there will be a, a, a great deal of suffering and pain and difficulty and trouble. Trials, those are coming. Um, the, the rapture is when God comes and gets all of his people and rescues them from kind of the final effects of the tribulation. And so I'm not going to give all the viewpoints there. Uh, but here was the concern when I was a kid. 
you better make yourself ready or you're going to get left behind, you know? And so I had these visions of piles of clothes everywhere. I don't, I don't know why we got raptured naked, but regardless, piles of clothes and people just being gone, right? Uh, when I was a kid, uh, DC Talk sang the, so- sang the song. Any DC Talk fans, right? White boy rapper, right? Well, they sang a song, um, and I want, I want to share with you the lyrics. It's called, I Wish We'd All Been Ready. So I'm a little kid, I'm, you know, hearing these songs. It says, life was filled with guns and war. They're painting the picture of, of, of the rapture. And all of us got trampled on the floor. I wish we'd all been ready. Children died and the days grew cold. A piece of bread could buy a bag of gold. I wish we'd all been ready. There's no time to change your mind. The sun has come and you've been left behind. And so I would be outside playing on a given day and come in and mom and dad wouldn't be in the house. And I'd think, oh. It's happened. Like, I've, I've done been left. It's over for us, you know. And then, praise God, my sister would walk into the room and my anxiety would drop a little bit. When I was a kid and you talked about Revelation, it was people that wanted to debate uh, some of the specifics of what's going to happen in the very end of times. And it was not something I got terribly excited to hear about. It made me kind of anxious. Uh, however, I want you to know that Revelation is a book of hope. Revelation is the book about Jesus Christ and the ultimate uh, final revelation of what he's going to do uh, at our end of days. As you study the book of Revelation, you need to know uh, that it's written by the Apostle John, the one whom Jesus loved. He was one of Jesus' closest uh, associates, and yet as he wrote what's written here in Revelation, it was during an extraordinarily difficult period for Christians. This was during the reign of the deranged emperor Nero, which if you know much about him, Nero blamed Christians for the burning of Rome. Uh, And so uh, he wanted to heap as much blame on them, kind of bring them into the public spotlight as much as possible, kind of make them enemy number one, if you will, of Rome. And so what he would do was he would take Christians and he would wrap them in pitch or dip them in tar. He would place them on poles and he would use them as torches at his dinner parties. Christians were killed by the hundreds and even the thousands. Um, He would sew them in animal skins. There at the the foot of Vatican Hill, there was a circus, and he would throw Christians to the the dogs to be torn limb from limb. When John wrote this book, it was not a particularly enjoyable time to be a believer. Things were extremely difficult. John himself knew what it was to suffer. Uh, He'd been arrested under Nero for preaching the gospel. He'd been boiled in oil. And when he writes this letter, he's in prison, exiled on the island of Patmos. Again, very difficult times. Nero was so cruel to Christians that even the Romans, who, you know, would cheer at the Colosseums, you know, if the the gladiators killed one another or the beasts were turned loose, even those Romans began to feel sympathy for the early Christians, for what they were enduring. Now, as John wrote Revelation, he is on Patmos. He receives a vision from the Lord. I'm going to summarize very, very briefly. He sees a vision of the churches and of the scrolls, of the witnesses, of the seven bowls of God's wrath. And ultimately, we're going to be here today where he receives a vision of the second coming of Jesus Christ, where Jesus returns to judge the world and restore all things. Now, if You were living in a time such as when John lived. If you had had friends and family members who had been used as torches at Nero's banquets, if you'd you'd seen the suffering, you would read Revelation as a book of extraordinary hope. You would look forward to the judgment for the people who had done things to you and your family. You would want to see justice be done for the wicked. And you would look forward to to Jesus coming and restoring all things and making them new. So read with me, if you will, in Revelation chapter 20. We're going to begin in verse 11. This is the vision that John saw of the final judgment. He says, Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. From his presence, earth and sky fled away and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were open. And then another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. 
And then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Now, what we're seeing here, again, is the final judgment being played out in this vision that John received. Now, um, every one of us will either see the day of our death or the second coming of Christ, like it's going to happen. Every one of us will ultimately stand before God to be judged. Now, what we see here in, in this passage is people being judged based upon what they had done. The determination for whether you're going to spend eternity in heaven with God, new heaven, new earth, or whether you'll spend it separated from God in a place called hell is whether or not your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. Now, I, I told you last week, as we celebrated the work of Jesus Christ for us on the cross, that for those of us who have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, Jesus came and fulfilled the law perfectly, right? He became our justification. He fulfilled the law that we couldn't fulfill. And that for those of us who find ourselves having sinned and owing a debt that we couldn't pay, Jesus came and paid that price we couldn't pay. He is our redemption. And for those of us who find ourselves deserving of God's wrath and judgment for our sin, Jesus came, bore our sin, and endured the wrath that we deserve. The hope of the gospel is what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. And we're not saved based upon what we've done, how good of lives we've lived, like, our, you know, are you pretty good? old gal, pretty good old guy, you know, are you, you know, LaFleur County, do you vote the right way and go to church some? Um, those are n not the requirements for entry into heaven or uh, punishment in hell. But there's one thing that matters, and that's whether your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. And the way that we receive salvation and forgiveness, the way that we clothe ourselves in the righteousness of Jesus, receive his justification, redemption, and propitiation, is through faith. It's a gift that we receive from God that we ultimately do not deserve. And so all of us will stand before God one day, and we will be judged. And we will either spend eternity with God in heaven, or we will face the second death described here as being thrown into the lake of fire. It's a place of separation from God and of eternal torment. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27 says, And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment, we will all face God one day. We'll stand in our own righteousness. Did you do good enough or did you not? And we'll all be found wanting if it's our own righteousness. Or we will stand in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. If anyone's name was not fit, found written in the Lamb's book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Jesus came to justify and redeem, to become a propitiation for the sins of the world, for all who would believe in him. And so uh, we have hope for every person, uh, for that you know, family member who's gone astray or the friend who hasn't come around. We have hope because of the work of Jesus Christ that they might ultimately be saved and would spend eternity with God in heaven. And yet, sometimes we grow a bit apathetic. Anyone grow apathetic in, in, our, in our pursuit of following Jesus and his commission to make disciples? The first thing that I want to share with you today about the second coming of Christ is that it gives us urgency in our mission to make disciples. What we recognize is that the time is short for us and for those who are around us, those who are living in the world today. The time is short. Maybe it's maybe maybe we'll live out our days and we'll you know die a, a good a death at a good old age, and maybe Jesus will return, but. Regardless of whether it's true, we'll all stand before God. And, and, and the time of our lives is like a tiny little blip on, on the, the radar of eternity. If you think about the scope of eternity, the 70 or 80 or 90 or 100 years, if you make it that old of our lives, they're like the blink of an eye. And so when we think about the second coming of Christ, of the coming judgment, it should give us urgency in our mission to make disciples. You see, Jesus went to the cross, and there he died. He suffered, and he bled, and he died. 
for the sins of the world. That anyone who would come to faith in him would not perish but would have everlasting life. He spent three days in the grave and he rose on the third day victorious over sin and death. And just before Jesus ascended into heaven, he commissioned us. If you call yourself a Christian, he commissioned you to go and make disciples of all the nations. But what our calling would be is to be like spiritual mailmen. You and I, we can't save anybody. We didn't offer the sacrifice on the cross. Our blood wouldn't be sufficient. Jesus is the Savior of the world. His sacrifice was sufficient. But what we are are like spiritual mailmen. We take the good news of what Jesus Christ has done, and we deliver that to people who need to hear that good news. And the second coming should give us urgency in spreading the gospel. It's been about 12 years ago now. Uh, we went to Florida with my family, and every year, big family vacation. My parents take us. They, they pay for the house, and we all show up. And, and uh, this time, uh, my son, Logan, was about two and a half years old. And so he's just getting to where he can get away from you. You know, when they start, they're walking, and they get kind of fast. And um, if you've been here in this church very long, you know that at times I'm a little bit forgetful. I don't always pay attention. I've left my kids behind at a couple of church events, you know, happens from time to time. Well, we, we're having a wonderful time on this vacation. We actually rented the pontoon boat because we're from eastern Oklahoma, you know, got to get in the pontoon. We went out on the, the ocean and we're headed to, to Shell Island. And it was an amazing day. It was a little bit hot. Uh, but where we finally pulled up there in, in the boat and got out, um, it was perfectly still, and I haven't really seen the ocean like this, but we were kind of hidden back here, perfectly still, and this beach, which was like super wide, like you could wade out 50 yards and only be, I don't know, like thigh deep, and so it was amazing, and, and it was the cool part about it, because there were no waves, Logan was able to get out in the water and kind of enjoy, you know, and so dad got a little bit of a break, I didn't have to watch him, the water was so shallow, really nothing to worry about. Uh, but there was a problem. I got a little hot, y'all. I was a little warm, and I needed to get out a little bit deeper so I could cool off in the ocean. It's a vacation. Well, I may have got a little bit distracted, and I remember hearing uh, my parents yelling, like, hey, Jason, where's Logan? I'm like, oh, I've done it again, you know, and I, I start kind of frantically looking around there on the beach, and I don't, I don't see Logan, and I'm looking in the water, and I don't see Logan. I, I, I'd seen him waiting, but I don't see him anymore, and then it hits me what probably happened. Uh, a lot of people had driven their pontoon boats up to this area, and they would tie them up right up on the beach, and well, the tide would go out, and the boats would get stuck. And the only way they could get those boats out is they would come and they would dig underneath like where the outboard motor was, right? So they could, you know, motor the boat out of there and, and, be, and be done. Well, Logan, unbeknownst to me at the time, had stepped off in one of those holes. And what I saw when I started kind of looking across the water was just his little hat floating there on the water. And I realized, oh my gosh, like my son's underwater. And so like any good dad would do, like I began to fight furiously. I was about waist deep in water and I'm just fighting with all that I have. I've got to get to my son, you know, and so I'm, I'm just fighting and I'm clawing and I'm just working because I know that the time is short. I've got to get to him. And so finally I make my way to Logan and I pick him up out of the water and praise God, he's fine. My wife would be furious at me forever if not. And, and like I, I look him in the eye and he's like, you know, dad, where you been? You know, you're supposed to protect me. And again, thank God that he was fine. But that wasn't something I was casual about. It wasn't something that I was like, oh, you know, no big deal. I can pick him up anytime. You know, what I understood was the urgency of the moment. That time was short. In church, we live in a moment. We live in a, in a, a period of life and time is short. And people around us are perishing. The needs are great. Listen, the atonement, the work of Jesus Christ, the redemptive work is finished. And the gospel, the good news, the hope of Christ, it's there. But our job and what Jesus has commissioned us to do, like spiritual male men and women, is to deliver that news to people that need to hear. And we've got to be careful as the church of Jesus Christ that we don't get distracted with all the things that we have going on in this life, you know, soaking up the the sun, or whatever it might be that we enjoy pursuing hobbies and chasing kids, that we lose sight of what's truly urgent, what's truly important right in front of us. Now, there's some good news 
Like we look out across our community, there's a tremendous amount of, of suffering, of hurt, of loss. Like we get calls almost every week. We work with DHS and they have a care portal that allows us to meet needs of kids who are going into foster care. And we love to meet those needs, but it's, it's tragic at the same time the number of phone calls that we get or the number of kids that are having to be taken away from parents due to addiction and abuse. Holly, we live, we live in a tough world, but there is hope in Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul reminds us of that hope in Romans chapter 10, verse 13. Here's the good news. He says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And so there's hope for your family member, and there's hope for your coworker, like there's hope for your neighbor, um, that person that you just met, the person whose lives have been wrecked by addiction, the person who's been abused and is about to give up hope, the one who is depressed and suffering. There is hope in Jesus Christ for ultimate healing for us. Everyone who calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. Yes, everyone has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But then the Apostle Paul, he, he poses a question to the church in Rome. Now, the church in Rome, where sharing the gospel might end, cause you to end up being boiled in tar and exiled to Patmos. The church in Rome, who had seen their friends and loved ones lit up as torches at banquets of Nero. He asked them this question. He says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But how then will they call on him in whom they haven't believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they've never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching to them? Praise God, we don't live in times like the Roman church lived in. But wouldn't it be an even greater tragedy if when we had relative ease and freedom of sharing We got busy and distracted and we failed to do so. We live in a town, a community, within a 15-mile radius of this church. There's about 50,000 people. And most of them do not follow Jesus Christ. They haven't come to faith in Him. They're not living their lives as disciples. Church, there is much work for us to be doing So as we think about the second coming of Christ, it gives us urgency to make disciples. We've been working on core values as a church, like trying to define this is who we are. Uh, One of our values we're working on is that we're a missional church who's committed to sending people and resources wherever God would lead us. And we do this because the time is short. I'll be honest with you. We're not a rich church. There's no one who works on staff here that's getting wealthy. Uh, We don't have everything we could ever want. Um, We're extremely blessed. We're grateful for your giving. But we very intentionally give sacrificially uh, to other churches, to other missionaries, because we want to see the gospel go to people that aren't ultimately here. So over the last several years, we've sent people and resources to Venezuela, to Turkey, to Northern Africa, to East Asia, to Lawrence, Kansas, and Edmond, Oklahoma, and all across LaFleur County. And we do that because we have the good news of the gospel that people need to hear that they might ultimately be saved. The good news that Jesus came and he lived and he died on the cross for their sins and he rose on the third day victorious over sin and death and that one day he's coming back to judge the world and restore all things. It has been rightly said of many churches, That as we pray, we're more concerned with keeping the saints out of heaven than we are sinners out of hell. So we'll pray for Sister Sally and all of her ailments like, God, don't take her, right? Like, we're very fervent about that. But for many of us, we offer few fervent prayers that sinners might ultimately be saved and spared from eternity in hell. Church, we need to be careful that our affluence, all of the blessings that God had given us, that they don't distract us from what we are here to do on the short time we're on this earth. And that's to do our work as spiritual male men and women, delivering the good news of the gospel to people who need to hear. So the second coming of Christ, 
It gives us urgency to make disciples of all the nations. It puts into perspective how short a time that we have. Um, but the second thing that it does is it makes us hopeful in the midst of our own personal affliction. Read with me in Revelation 21, verse 1 through 5. He continues seeing this vision. He says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eye and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. For you and I, as we go throughout this life, we can be really thankful um, that we're not suffering under a Nero-esque persecution. We're not watching our friends being martyred for their faith right and left. Christianity is a legal religion here. But at the end of the day, that's not true all around the world. There are many Christians in places where it's illegal to, to share their faith. But no matter where Christians are, every one of us is going to endure trials. Jesus warned us that we're going to endure difficult things in this life. But he, he called us to take heart because he's overcome the world. In this life, you will have troubles. None of us are immune from that. Every one of us has suffered. We've lost loved ones. We've known the sting of sin. We're living in this time. It's, we, we call it the already but not yet. We have been saved by Jesus Christ, but we've not yet experienced the full restoration of all things. We know that it's coming, but we're still here in this world, in this place, and at this time, for this short time before Jesus returns. And living in this world at this moment means that we're still going to endure suffering. There's still loss. We still get the phone calls about the diagnosis. We still see marriages suffering from pornography and adultery. And individuals suffering from addiction and abuse. Like, we could write those stories a thousand times over. And yet, for us who are believers, no matter what is to come, whether things get a whole lot worse, inflation keeps going, right? We lose everything we have or whether things get better in some ways, we'll, we'll continue to feel the effects of sin. But because we know that this time is short, it doesn't feel short, right? We have to allow our minds to be renewed in the word. In the midst of suffering, it doesn't feel short. It doesn't feel insignificant, but we're reminded that our time of suffering in this life is short compared to the span of eternity in which we're going to get to live with Jesus perfect relationship with him and with one another and with his creation once again because he's coming again and so the second coming of christ it gives us urgency to make disciples and it makes us hopeful in the midst of affliction today if you're here and you're suffering i want to remind you that our good god loves us he knows the number of hairs on our head he sees everything that we go through and ultimately, Romans 8, 28, he has promised us that he is working all things for our good. And all things means all of the things, those that feel good and those that are painful and hurt. Even when we're sinned against or we sin, God is working that for the good of those who love him and who have been called according to his purposes. The second coming of Christ gives us hope in the midst of our affliction. It allows us to persevere knowing that this is just for a short time before Jesus Christ comes back again. The Apostle Paul, he, he was, was going to face death. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 55, he says something to the church at Corinth um, that if you didn't understand that there was a second death coming, if you didn't understand that that. Paul wasn't looking toward this life, but rather to the next one where he would spend it with, with Christ in, in heaven. Um, it wouldn't make sense, but he says this in 1 Corinthians 15, 55. He says, O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? Y'all, you know, it's not as if 
We're not going to face death in this life. Barring the second coming of Jesus, every one of us will feel that first death. But we can approach death with hope. That ultimately we'll get to rule and reign with Jesus and spend eternity with Him where there's no more weeping, where He wipes away the tears from our eyes and no more suffering and no more pain. Because God is good and this life is temporary, we look through the pain of our circumstances and we can say, It is well with my soul. We can trust him with our suffering, asking him to take what feels so painful and so broken and to bring something good out of those things. This month, we're celebrating the birth of Jesus Christ. We're celebrating his coming, that God took on flesh and made his dwelling among us, that he came to give us hope and freedom from sin, freedom from not just the the the, the way that sin had controlled us in our lives, but we can be set free from the punishment and the power of sin where we are uh, living lives of abundance in Christ Jesus. But we're also reminded in his first coming that he's coming back again, where we'll no longer feel the sting of sin and death, where pain will be no more, and we'll spend an eternity with him in heaven. Would you bow with me? Jesus, we praise you. We have so much to be thankful for. That that you came and you took on human flesh. And that you endured the cross. That you became our justification, our redemption, and our propitiation. That you loved us enough to suffer and die for us. But Lord, today we want to take a minute and praise you and look forward to the time when you come again. Where death shall be no more. There's no more suffering and no more hurting and no more pain. Where you've restored all things. And we enjoy a perfect relationship with you and everything you've created once again. God, we praise you for that in Jesus' name. Amen.